For the last 20 years, questions of immigration and identity have been at the heart of our politics. Yet we have made almost no progress. Why is Oosdeel not a Dutch name? How did the Netherlands become more ethnically segregated than the United States? Why are riots in the Schilderswijk an integration problem, but riots in Urk not? To answer these questions, we've invited Zini Oosdeel, historian, columnist, and former member of parliament for GroenLinks. Yet unlike many of his left-leaning compatriots, Oosdeel believes we should do away with the old multicultural consensus in favor of inclusive nationalism. Together, we'll explore the struggle for acceptance and belonging among those of migrant origin, the roots of the Dutch migration story, and how we can create a truly inclusive national identity. Welcome to Room for Discussion, Zini Oosdeel. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, welcome very much indeed. Uh, I think we'll quickly start off with a question that I think you get uh, quite a lot. Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, I have to be honest with you. Uh, until I spent a semester as a graduate student at Central Michigan University, United States, which was a long time ago, which, which I will not delve into right now, but long time ago, I went to the United States as a graduate student because my graduate thesis was on American migration history. And unwittingly, unconsciously, I, like, I'm, I, I guess anybody, any person of color in the Netherlands, or also any person that has a, how, how Dutch people will say it, uh, for, they call it a foreign na last name, um, being used to ask with good intentions, I want to add, where are you from? Which was, which was a normal thing, right? In the United States, as an uh, exchange student, it struck me that my students, citizens, um, Americans from all walks of, life, walks of life never asked, where are you from? If they're interested in your ethnic background, they will ask, what's your ethnicity? or what's your nationality? So back then when I was so young and still hadn't uh, uh, researched, taught, uh, worked on um, citizenship and nationalism, that struck me. I th it, it felt more welcoming. I think what you pointed out, white Dutch people in general, with good intentions, I'm still adding that, with good intentions, asking people of color, where are you from? The subtext of that question is, you really don't belong here. I mean, I don't mind you being here. I'm interested in where you are from, even when you're born here, even if you're a Dutch citizen. And I think this is a very small but very telling example of the problems I try to uh, tackle in my book and in my work. Yeah. And you feel that it, by, by sort of otherizing people in that way, is that's what makes the question wrong, in your opinion? Well, I don't know if the question is wrong. The thing I'm interested in is the social, political, and cultural uh, um, dimensions behind a question like this in a country where it doesn't matter if you have been here for 60 years, in my case, like my uh, grandfather came here in the 1960s, or in the case of Dutch people with a Surinamese or Antrinese background for 400 years, or Indonese background for 400 years, they've been part of the Netherlands after such a long time, after generations and generations of being Dutch, still being asked, where are you from? I think, that, I think it's more interesting to ask ourselves, what is the social, political, cultural consensus that makes a question like this normal in this country? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and how do you see yourself in, in light of those kind of questions? <laughs> well, um, before I uh, discovered, in my opinion, I mean, America, the U.S. has a lot of problems, don't get me wrong. Institutional racism, uh, 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 I mean, an extreme var variant, variant of the neoliberal uh, um, uh, police state, prison industrial complex, which, by the way, the Netherlands is also walking towards to for another time. One thing, and this is, I think, the product of the civil rights movement, uh, um, the one thing the U.S. does exceptionally well is culturally, I mean, culturally, the, the general consensus of citizenship is way more inclusive than that of the uh, Netherlands. So before I went to the U.S., before I became 
woke. I became woke about nationalism, about inclusive nationalism. Before I became woke about inclusive nationalism, I would answer the typical Dutch. And I would say, oh, yeah, I'm from Turkey, I would say, uh -huh. when I was younger. But after I became woke about this inclusive, real multicultural nationalism, I will always answer, I'm from Rotterdam. <laughs> and usually, I, I'm, one more thing, and usually the next question will then be, oh, but where are you really from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sini, also from my side, thank you for being with us uh, today. For thank me you. personally, this is a very peculiar situation because we are three people here, two of which are Dutch, one which isn't. And a lot of people who don't know either one of us might expect me to be the one who's Dutch, where I'm yeah. the one who isn't. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. this unspoken perception of what Dutchness should look like is also what you're heading towards when you ask the question, yeah. why is Esdiel not a Dutch name? Yeah. So growing up, what are some of the experiences you made that made you aware of discrimination in your own country? Can you share some with us, maybe? Well, yeah, my, my, my experience here growing up, I think, is not really exceptionally different than most young people of color. I mean, let's take my sister. I think she's uh, also listening in. I, I hope so. <laughs> my, my little sister, who was born in the Netherlands, she's studying at the uh, University College Maastricht. And I mean, she's still in 2021, gets the same questions, remarks that I used to get, uh, like sometimes jokingly, sometimes out of interest. But the material effect of being the other in your own country is really uh, uh, deep. You don't have to believe me. We can all, the Netherlands is also exceptionally well researched. I, I, I personally experienced being discriminated in the Dutch labor market against because of my last name, uh, the housing market. I personally experienced this. I'm not going to talk about not being able to, uh, to, to go to clubs and bars as a student in Rotterdam because that's standard. I think it's suspect when you're a person of color and you're not being uh, <laughs> held back at the door. <laughs> that's, that's extraordinary, you know? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about racism, uh, discrimination, I think it's very important not only that we discuss personal experiences, uh, but also we make a structural analysis. Otherwise, it's going to remain a personal experience. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah no, indeed. Like, I think one, one of the reasons that you point out for the way we kind of view certain groups of people as different or less Dutch is the way we talk about people. For instance, the term uh, allochtone. So in your opinion, first of all, what, what are the origins of this word and, and why is it problematic yeah. in your opinion? Well, thank you for this question. This is actually something I'm really proud about. Um, in my book, Nederland, my fatherland, for my book, I tried to find out how exactly this term became standard in Dutch official language, official documents, and also in daily language. Well, we, we all know that Hilda van Jonker, uh, for Hilda van Jonker was a very progressive left-wing uh, um, uh, uh, social scientist who in the night in 1971 she wrote a report we call it advice in the netherlands but it's basically a report uh, for the dutch government in which she said in which she proposed how the netherlands should deal with migrants and their offspring for the next generations and her husband happened to be a geographer and in, in uh, sorry a geologist i have to say and in geology, the terms allochtonus and autochtonus were standard lexicon. An allochtone rock formation is a rock formation that has moved through earthquakes or some other natural happenings to a, to a layer of, of, of to a layer in the earth where it doesn't belong. Literally, this is allochtone rock formation. This, the original term allochtone and autochtone is from geology. It's not from social sciences or humanities. But she decided to import these ter terms into the Dutch official language about people. And one thing that I found out, which I didn't know, and nobody knew, but we knew it because we, we sensed it. Um, she, said, she said, the reason I'm choosing this term, Allochtone, for these specific groups, because she names the specific ethnic groups as well in this document in 1971. She names a lot of ethnic groups. It's all people of color, Indonesian, Japanese, Turkish, Moroccan. 
just, just, just foreigners of color. And she says, literally, with good intentions, I'm going to quote now, I chose these specific groups of migrants to call alochtone because of their opfallen, what's English for opfallen, um, opfallen the house clear? Their, their skin color stands out. Yes, because their skin color stands out. I'm quoting right now from the report, from this progressive report, from this progressive social scientist in order to, you know, wel welcome, because their skin color stands out, I'm going to call these specific groups alochtone. This is how, it, this is the beginning of the term alochtone was racist with good intentions. So long story short, in the, in, the, in the following 30, 40 years, the term became more scientific, quote unquote, but not really. But because I wrote this in my book, uh, Kim Putters, who was the head of, the, of one of the statistical bureaus in the Netherlands, uh, they were having a debate. You know, should we get rid of the, these, these terms? Should we find other terms? And I'm so proud uh, that when he read my book, he said, wow, I didn't know that this is effed up. We're going to get rid of the term alochtone. Zini is right. So I know I can say I'm a bit proud. I'm I'm the I'm like I'm like the 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 the, the knight, the Dutch knight that toppled the term alochtone. And what I get from how you describe this is that it's not necessarily the word, but it's the connotations that we have with it yeah. that make it so problematic. How do we make sure in the future that we use words that are fair to everyone? To use words that yeah. acknowledge this as well. Well, yeah, this is, I think, the, 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 the essence of my argument. Uh, my argument is when we, in our hearts and minds, accept the fact that all Dutch people are Dutch, this is my nationalism, then it's not very hard to think of inclusive terms for Dutch people. I'm Dutch. I'm Turkish. If you want to know my ethnicity, Turkish Dutch, but always Dutch, because that doesn't take away my nationality, my country. Uh, from from me because of my skin color. Now, the, ter the so the terminology I think has always is always an effect of the the, the 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 cultural consensus in a certain country. Now the next question and stop me if I'm going too fast. But the next question will be obviously is so now you're Zini now you're talking about people who are already Dutch citizens. What about refugees, immigrants? You're you're excluding them. My answer is no being inclusive about net of, about citizenship in a certain country does not necessarily exclude people coming in this is an arbitrary dichotomy in my opinion yeah, yeah, yeah. but you of course have people who say oh isn't this just you know political correctness maybe today we say people with a migrant background is the politically correct word tomorrow that word will be seen as otherizing and then we need a new yeah. word so is it really about the <laughs> word or uh... Yeah. Well, well, for, for, for those who are not uh, up to date, well, I managed in toppling the term alochtone. Then the uh, Dutch government decided to say um, Dutch person with a migrant background, which is like four words, right? Um, Nederlander or D Dutch, a Dutch, Dutch man or woman or other with I'm ha I'm happy with this step because it includes it includes my Dutchness, but I, again, if it were if I if it were up to me, I would be very Amer quote unquote American in this. Why why does the Netherlands have so much trouble with calling Dutch people Dutch when they have a different skin color when they're persons of color? What's the effing problem? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it's not that hard. You know, we're Dutch. That's it. No, no, no. No, indeed. So, you know, we've kind of talked about, you know, segregation of words, but of course, there's, of course, segregation in uh, real life. And what what very much surprised me in your book is that the Netherlands is more segregated than the yeah. United States. So 70 percent of non-white children in the Netherlands go to a majority non-white school, only 50 percent in America. Yeah. How did the Netherlands become so segregated? Well, yeah. And this is this is the this is the this is maybe the crux of, of everything I, I try to put forward in the Dutch debate. I mean, it's not a coincidence that apartheid, which we all know from South Africa, is a Dutch word. Uh, I don't want to bore you too long with Dutch history, but the Netherlands is a country where historically tolerance, this is an important you have to remember, tolerance was imposed since the 16th century to organize society. Now, tolerance, has a positive connotation. 
But when you really think about it, when you talk about tolerance in the context of organizing society, of dividing people or organizing people, when you really think about it, tolerance is one of the most, in my opinion, horrific tools to organize society. Why? Because when I tolerate you, it does. It means that there's a power. Of, I mean, uh, there's a, a difference in power. I am tolerating you. I don't like you. You're a minority, but I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to tolerate you, but you're not my equal. You can be here and we don't like you. <laughs> that's that's tolerance, really. Tolerance. You, you tolerate the loud music of your of your neighbor late at night, or you don't. But tolerance always has a hierarchy within it. So in the 16th century, when the when the Dutch uh, Calvinists uh, took over power in this country, the majority of the population was still Catholic. Now, you, they, they talked about, should we kill them all off, which was kind of normal back then. <laughs> and they decided, no, because then uh, we're going to screw up our economy, the proto-capitalist Dutch economy. So what are, what are we going to do? We're going to tolerate them. What happened? Catholics, uh, Jews, and other minorities in the Netherlands became tolerated in separate, really segregated, separate apartheid system, which, which was recycled over and over again. The Dutch people will know about the frisouling, etc. Okay, and then in the 1960s, the same cultural instrument of tolerance was imposed to say, you know, I've mentioned the term allochton, but we're going to have a multicultural society because we have guest workers from Turkey, from Morocco, from whatever, and we're going to tolerate them. And this is multicultural, which means they, they will have they will retain their own, quote unquote, own culture, which is by definition different from Dutch culture. And we're going to stimulate their otherness. We're going to tolerate them in different segregated uh, uh, neighborhoods and organizations. And this is multicultural. This is progress. Well, actually, this is literally what, what Hendrik Verwoerd did in South Africa. You know, so stop me if I'm too confusing or if there's any questions, but... The long story short, um, apartheid, segregation, tolerance, multiculturalism all come from the same cultural uh, point of view of segregating people because you don't really like them, but you're not going to kill them. So multiculturalism is basically just a newer word or a different code for something that has been in place for a much longer time. Exactly. You, and yeah. yes. Because and it's the thing. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, but could you still point out what is so problematic about the multicultural policies that are in place today or, or in place a couple of decades ago? I will give you one example. Um, through this, oh, sorry, specifically in the Netherlands, like uh, the white Dutch society was became, becoming less segregated. Um, the pillarization is, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for those who are not aware of this history, but Uh, the frisouling, the polarization was being dismantled from the 1960s onward. Young Dutch people said, we're not going to accept segregation in this country through denominations. So Catholics, Protestants, and others were segregated. Young white Dutch people, left-wing Dutch people, progressive Dutch people said, we're not going to accept this anymore. And they were right. But these same left-wing progressive Dutch people, 20 years later, imposed the same thing on people of color with good intentions. So one of the effects is, Literally, I'm not even exaggerating, Nazis, literal Nazis, but from the, of color, from uh, countries where Dutch people of color are from, are still in 2021 being subsidized by Dutch government for integration. I mean, literal Nazis, I, I mean, gray wolves and whatnot. Even today? It's still, sorry? Even today, you say? Even today. I wrote about it in Friday Night It's amazing. And I can go on for one more hour about all the effects of this segregation and multiculturalism, but it's, in my opinion, multiculturalism, at least as it was defined in the Netherlands, is one of the most racist instruments with good intentions to segregate people because of their skin color. No. Uh, you talk very much, of course, about the role of the left in kind of creating this, this false no. multiculturalism. But of course, we all know that you are part of a progressive left party, Groen Links, so how do you reconcile your role in Groen Links, a party which arguably has supported some of these uh, things, uh, with you know your own stances and critique of multiculturalism? Uh, yeah. Well, that's an excellent question. And I, I, I write about this in my book as well, uh, which was before I entered politics. You see, 
I really appreciate the discussion we're having today. And I mean, you don't even have to be a left wing or right wing. I mean, let's talk about this in terms of civilization. If, if anybody who is civil, in my opinion, should at least listen to my arguments, which are not really my arguments, but I, I think arguments of humanity. I can talk about this for hours with ex the extreme right wing, with the right wing. I, I do. I'm a liberal in that sense. I, I debate with them. But I know I will never, never convince right wing politics of the basic fact that people of color are also Dutch, even as Dutch as they are. That doesn't really fit in the extreme, let's say the extreme right wing or the extreme right wing definition of nationalism. I don't have really hope to change their opinion. But because I am left wing and progressive and I think inclusive, I have hope in, in changing the hearts and minds of my own blood group, you know, because the aims are the same. We have the same aim, but I mean, we're going to talk about it. We have to talk about the, the instruments we're using. So it's a matter of hope, actually. If we look at the elections, though, that just happened, we see that the left progressive parties have suffered arguably quite a big defeat. Would you place some of the responsibility for the election results on the promotion of multicultural policies by these parties? Well, I'm not sure if that's the main reason, because there's another very specific Dutch thing about progressive politics. I mean, trust me. You, maybe you know why I'm not a politician anymore. That's, 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 the Netherlands is the only country in the world, and I'm not saying this, this to bash my former colleagues, but the Netherlands is the only country in the world, world where the neoliberal, debt-ridden student debt system was, was um, imposed by progressive politics, by the Green Party, <laughs> by the Labour Party. I mean, I'm sorry. No other Green Party or, La or Labour Party, in the, in the, in the, in the, at least in the world, in the world I know, would ever think about imposing a debt system for students, or imposing a so-called flexible labour market, or uh, increased pensions even if you're poor. I can go. I think the main reason in the Netherlands specifically for the demise of left-wing politics is regular people, middle class, lower class people, people of color, uh, who have been voting for these parties, but they've been basically screwed over and over again in terms of economic policies. I think that's the main reason. Probably this multicultural failure that I talk about, which, by the way, is not only left-wing. The left-wing is one of the main proponents, but this was the consensus also by the VVD and CDI and everybody in the Netherlands. So long, long answer to your question, but I think that the, um, the failure of progressive politics in the Netherlands, left-wing politics too, you know, not impose neoliberalism. I think that's the main reason. People, I mean, people are not really, people are, are aware of this, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, we, we talk quite a lot about uh, the historic roots of integration, but we also want to move to the more current situation. Since 2002, the focus has shifted or tilted a little bit from multiculturalism towards integration. And um, you criticize in your book how we talk about integration, that, for instance, yeah. it focuses a lot on criminality. Yeah. Other than that, what would you say is wrong with how we talk about integration here? Oh, I would say, like, the way the Netherlands talks about integration and makes policy about integration is 100% wrong on all facets, everything, from the beginning to the end. It's, it's amazing. I'm sorry. You know, for those who are not Dutch, let me explain to you. In this country, the Dutch government measures integration. They have yearly integration reports. And they have three main tools to measure whether a person of color is integrated. Education, so the, the so-called higher your education is, the more integrated you are if you are a person of color. Criminality, so if you you know, the criminality statistics by ethnic groups are being measured to deter in order to determine whether an ethnic group is integrated. What was the other one? There's another one. Employment. Sorry? Uh, employment, jobs. Employment, yes, yes. I'm, I'm just, yes. So whether you're employed, whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're on welfare is also a measurement for integration if you have a, a darker skin color. I'm sorry. This is the most racist S H I T ever. Why would why why am I not allowed to integrate as a jobless uh, person 
or as a personal welfare or or a carpenter. The, the, it, the, and white Dutch people are never put under these measurements for integration. So it's another typically Dutch way of being a very well-intentioned racist society to divide people in terms of color and to have several measurements only for them to, to, to label them. And my frustration is, to be honest with you, I've been talking about this for 15 years and still nothing is changing. But I mean, of course, it is the case that, you know, if you look at things like education, uh, employment, criminality, there are real differences between different ethnic groups. So how should we talk about those problems if you say we shouldn't talk about it in terms of integration? Well, yeah, the thing is, um, I think criminality is a problem of criminality. Uh, education is very important for everybody. What was the last one? Employment, uh, employment yeah. is also very important for everybody. They don't have anything to do with, with integration. Employment is about employment. Education is about education. And what was the other one? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, criminality is a social problem for everybody. Yeah. Why, why create an arbitrary, you know, correlation which doesn't exist in real life between those things? Now, to, getting back to your question, this is very interesting. Until 2006, uh, in these integration reports, these measurements, these three measurements, employment, uh, 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 criminality, and education, they, they were, you know, so the statistics say Moroccan Dutch people are three times more likely to be criminal, okay? Until 2006, they had an, ex an addendum to these reports, to these statistics, gewogen. Uh, these same statistics, but then gewogen, uh, measured, Wait, they called it. Weighted. Mm -hmm. How? And this is... How they would say, now we're going to look at class. You know, we're going to just look at the same class within these ethnic groups. So white Dutch, quote unquote, lower class, Moroccan Dutch, quote unquote, lower class, Turkish Dutch. What, you know what, what happened when they did these gewogen uh, measured statistics? The difference, between, of, the, the difference in statistics between criminality within these groups almost vanished. Yeah. It's about class. But since 2006, the Statistics Bureau in the Netherlands doesn't do the gewogen anymore. So now everybody thinks it's about ethnicity. No, it's about class. No, no, no. Okay, so we, we shouldn't look at those things for integration. Uh, the question is, of course, then what should we look at? Uh, you know, Absolutely. Many, people, many people talk about the difference between integration and uh, assimilation. You could say, okay, everyone should eat, uh, you know, a stump <laughs> and listen to other houses. But I, I don't think that's what you're talking about. So, so what should integration look like for you? Well, the... the it's going to sound very postmodern, but I would say integration is about nothing. We should not talk about it. My point is, by definition, anything that any Dutch person eats or listens to, or what kind of name they have, what they believe or not believe, by definition, it's Dutch. Okay? So, for example, a very orthodox, very conservative, right-wing, Salafist, Muslim Dutch is Dutch. You will never... Not ever say that his way of looking at religion is un-Dutch. I, I want to debate with people like this about the, the how, how you say the, the morality of their politics, but never place them out of Dutchness. And this is this is something I really learned in the U.S. And this is also something that's very very hard to talk about in the Netherlands. It's not about no matter what I eat or or what my name is. I'm Dutch, so it's Dutch. It's you know integration is not it's, it's not some you know, um, spreadsheet tool you should measure and, you know, have policies about. No. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry. But I mean, but even then, right, like surely any country, I mean, you of course earlier talked about the United States, any country has maybe a set of, of values or, or national things. So what would those have to be in the Netherlands? Uh, I think, I think, I think and you don't have to agree with me. I think it's a big myth that, uh, of course, countries propose they have certain values, I mean, Western countries have great values about humanity, about democracy, about human rights. I really adhere to those values. They, you know, historically, they come from the West, but they're not West, Western. I think they're universal human. But by the same token, Western countries have, uh, not, take, have not taken these values very seriously in the past few centuries. To, to, you know? So I don't think... I don't think I mean, even someone who says, I don't believe in democracy. I want the Netherlands to be a theocracy. 
if someone says this, I want them, I want everybody to accept that this argument is just as Dutch as another argument. I don't agree with this argument. I want to debate this person. But why place someone out of Dutchness when they say something that's not according to the, to the professed values by the government? But if we take values out of the equation, isn't then a nation just a structural entity, just an organizational grouping? And so why would you still be in favor of nationalism, any kind of it, if it's just a, a structure? Oh, this is, this is really the great, great question. Okay. I'm going to try to answer this in a way that doesn't confuse everybody, because this is, I think, the, the crux. By the, everything I just said, in the same token, I really believe people have an a urgency or a, or a belonging, sense of belonging, right? This can be in a, in a very local way, for example, your family or your religion or your politics, political you know, club you're adhering to. But when we're talking about an international system of 180 plus countries, which is organized around the nation state, whether, whether we like it or not, we have to deal with the nation state as an international system and for a long time coming, by the way. And my belief, my hope is that while we're dealing with this international system, with the nation state as, a very, as the crux of international politics and domestic and national politics, why not create a, a consensus in citizenship that does not exclude anybody? So if, For example, I can become a very orthodox or extreme right, let's call it extreme right wing uh, uh, racist, let's say I become this. And another person has a different argument. We should, we should both be, I mean, I, I really would disagree with the racist person, don't get me wrong, but both the argument should be about their politics, not whether they belong in a certain country. So inclusive nationalism, I think inclusive nationalism opens the way for everybody, if they would like to do this, feel home at a certain place, not be discriminated against because of the skin color at, to, at the least. And then we can have a democratic debate about how we're going to organize society in the future. I think it's, it's a very proper way to, to, to have democracy. Now, I think this is a very interesting discussion, but we have a few more questions to get through. So I'm going to shift slightly. Um, you always already hinted at that there's a lot of study material that supports your points. For instance, the point you made on labor market discrimination. Just to ease us in, and because probably not everybody has read your book, which I recommend. Um, what was your experience with the Dutch labor market? Something specific. Yeah. Well, for, so when I, 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 I was studying history in Rotterdam, and I came back from the U.S., As a graduate student, I just had to finish my thesis. And back then, we didn't have, we didn't have a lane stelso, a debt-ridden system. So I, I could take my time. But I decided to go for a job with intellectual content. And I applied everywhere. And not, not one place invited me for, um, an, for, uh, an interview. for an interview. For an interview. Thank you. At, at, in the, uh, my friend who was uh, an exchange student from Belgium with a Dutch sounding name, uh, who was white, who didn't have any experience in the labor market. We, you know what we did? We, all these applications I did, we did together. And she got invited for an interview every time. So, you know, maybe it's coincidence, but I don't think so. So th this was one of the many examples I personally had with discrimination in the Netherlands. And yeah, let me tell you, it's not a nice thing to experience. Another, another thing, I was a, um, my high school was a grammar school, gymnasium in Rotterdam. You know, I was really arrogant. Oh, look at me. I'm, I'm intelligent, you know, and <laughs> I, I made it. And then, you know, when I was 15 or 16, the, I, 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 went, I went out with my white Dutch gymnasium friends. First time going out in my life. You know what happened? We're standing in line and I was the only one refused entry to this club because of my skin color. So, and these are experiences a lot of young Dutch people have of color in the Netherlands. Yeah. 
So what you describe, I guess some maybe left-wing uh, people would call it like, you know, white privilege. But I think, you know, a lot of people when they hear a term like that, I think outside of an Amsterdam or progressive circles, it's a very alien concept, you know, yeah. many people feel defensive. So how, could you, how can you talk about such issues in a way that isn't off-putting, yeah. discriminating to the vast majority of Dutch people? Well, Simba, this is the $64 million question. <laughs> and to be, to, be, to be honest with you, I'm still thinking about this, trying to come up with something. You know, I really don't know. Because on the one hand, white privilege does exist. But it does exist, I think, in certain specific modes of society, certain specific contexts, very important context. At the same time, I mean, let, look, look at me. I, I had all these experiences, but, you know, I'm an ex-parliament, I'm an ex-member of parliament. Uh, I write for the most prestigious newspapers in the Netherlands. I'm not poor, to say the least. No, I used to be poor. So, well, and then I, I'm talking, I, I'm, I'm doing this for a couple of years. I'm talking with very poor white Dutch people, uh, welfare moms, so-called welfare moms, for example. I talk with victims of the Tuslake scandal, who are, some of them are white. Uh, very poor people uh, all over the country, poor white people, really victims of neoliberalism. I mean, I'm like, okay, white privilege exists, but do they have, do these people, white people have more privilege, privilege than me? I'm not sure. No. So the, 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 the Zoektocht, um, um, I think that the, 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 the search we should have both of us, all of us, is how are we going to, you know, uh, pu put on the table the existence of white privilege without alienating poor white people who are me maybe even more victims of neoliberalism than Simba and me? And really, I don't have a clear answer right now, but this is a, this is a very important question. But I think you touch upon this million dollar question in your book when you are bringing up examples of the United States as a as a role model, how to talk about racial issues, how to talk about integration. Why do you think children of immigrants in America are seen as less foreign as children of immigrants in Europe? Yeah, well, th this I think has, has a lot to do with desegregation. I mean, the United States governments had a huge desegregation program from the 1960s onwards. The government would um, use government school buses to enforce that uh, young children of color were going to white, rich white schools. And I think um, when we, are, we accomplish a society where generations grow up being used to people of color and vice versa, then it really helps uh, culturally uh, and all, in all other facets of life, uh, uh, the acceptance of diversity. I think this is really is still a big problem in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is one of the most segregated, segregated countries in the world, not only by ethnicity, but also by class. This is, I think, a big challenge, which, which needs to be tackled by young people especially, but also by politics. Yet, despite the fact that um, integration is kind of woven into the DNA of the United States, also because this is the history, much of the history of the country, the years of Donald Trump and also the, just the last year has shown that there are some real issues there. We've seen George Floyd, we've seen an increase in Asian American violence just now with Corona and and um, the the, in, the a flight ban for mostly Muslim countries a couple of years back. Would you still say America is an example to follow and, and why or how? Okay, okay. Don't get me wrong. I really dislike Donald Trump and his politics, to say that. <laughs> I think he's one of the most dangerous politicians in human history in all aspects, from, from climate change to racism. Don't get me wrong. But I wrote about this in NRC in my column. Let's compare... Donald Trump's discourse with that of Mark Rutte, the Dutch prime minister. Mark Rutte literally said about young Dutch people of color, Rottogop, F off, go back to Turkey. Dutch young people who were born and raised here. Donald Trump, again, don't get me wrong, I really detest his politics. It's very dangerous, very racist. But 
Donald Trump never ever said about American citizens that they should be expelled because whatever reason. He's talking about immigration, which I still think is horrible. He's talking about illegal immigrants. He's talking about Muslim immigrants. Still horrible shit. Don't get, sorry, uh, S-I-T. But when we, I mean, let's zoom out here and forget the, forget the puppets, Mark Ritter and, and Donald Trump, but we can maybe have an anal analysis of the cultural consensus of both countries. Even if Donald Trump would personally believe that American citizens of color should be expelled, he's smart enough to realize when, when he says this, even most of his own base would not agree with this. And this is really, really the result of young people of color in the US struggling for civil rights since the 1960s. You know, Rosa Parks didn't say when she was refused uh, a seat in front of the bus in 1954, she didn't say, well, you know, let it go. Maybe I'll go back to Africa. No, she said, I'm an American. This is my country as well as yours. And I'm gonna struggle for my nationalism and citizenship. And the effect of this is a cultural change where even Donald Trump cannot say American citizens of color should be expelled. But in Holland, you can still say it. You get more votes if you say this. But I mean, is that exactly fully accurate? Because I think it was also Trump who said to, I think, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was born in America, yeah, yeah. that she should go back to her country. So oh, no. isn't that discourse coming <laughs> to America as well? Uh, yeah, well, well I, I, I mentioned this specifically in the, in the column I just mentioned. He, talk, he, he talked about the squad. You know, it's not just Cortez, it's also uh, two yeah, Arab, um, yeah, so a Somali-American and an Arab-American woman, uh, among others. And the thing is, you know, this is where, you know, this is, don't get, I, I hate Trump and his party, but the interesting thing is, he said, you know, why don't they, they go back where they're from and then come back with best practices to tell us how to, <laughs> he said, he said, and then come back because he knows otherwise you'll be screwed. It's really interesting. Uh, right, Mark Rutte didn't say, then come back. <laughs> no, he can stay there, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we can, of course, talk about, you know, the integration problems uh, forever, but of course, you know, it's not helpful if we don't come with, you know, solutions. <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, you've proposed your idea of inclusive nationalism, and you've also said that, you know, Dutch people of color, that we should reclaim our Dutchness. So what exactly does this inclusive nationalism look like? Well, you know, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to sound like this preacher who has all the answers and blah, blah, blah. But if you pull my leg, is that the expression? No. Pull my arm. If you pull my arm. Um, one, one basic thing I would really suggest to everybody, white, Dutch, it doesn't matter, especially young people, is don't deny your own citizenship. It, it hurts me to still, in this day and age, speak to a lot of young people of color in the Netherlands who literally say, I'm not Dutch. They're born and raised here, I'm not Dutch. And this is really, really not the way to go. Think about Rosa Parks, think about Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all the others who said, I am an American and I wanna claim my citizenship and I wanna be, have an equal say in everything this country stands for. This is the struggle I think we all have to, to, to wage, no matter what your politi politics are, no matter what your ethnicity is, but especially young people of color in the Netherlands, you know, don't, don't deny your own citizenship. Because when, if you do, you agree with Wilders. He says the same thing. Yeah. Now, um, I think you can already tell from my last question on this. I'm a bit wary when it comes to the concept of nationalism. I am born in Germany, so by definition, we have a difficult connotation with this. Um, and I wonder, doesn't inclusive nationalism just shift the intolerance for the minority within the country, or not intolerance, but disintegration, discrimination for the minority within the country to the outside border, which is also kind of random in that regard? Yeah. Yeah, well, this, I mean, I, I, I think it, it all depends on how you um, fulfill this idea of nationalism. It's just a word. I mean, I don't see any contradiction between you know, adhering to the message of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, which says, I am a citizen of this country. I'm proud, I'm proud of this country and I wanna have an equal say in the affairs of this country. I'm a nationalist and you don't, you're not, I'm not gonna let you take away my nationalism because of my skin color. I don't see any contradiction with this message and also the message of 
welcoming people in, in this country, whether they're citizens or not. Humanity is humanity. Not, nationalism doesn't have to be excluding or hierarchical. It, same, same with multiculturalism, by the way. It's just a word. We have to be really scientific about how it's implemented, mm -hmm. how it's culturally embedded in our consciousness. And then the word doesn't really matter, in my opinion. No, no. Now, you, may, you mentioned, of course, that it's people of color who must reclaim you know, their Dutch identity. But as, as you said as well, many people don't. I think something like 40% of those of Moroccan origin say they don't feel Dutch. So what do we do when people don't want to em embrace this inclusive nationalism, as you call it? Well, I don't think there's much to do except my, my personal strategy, as that's all I'm going to be, be able to talk about. My personal strategy is repeat the message, you know, stay in discussion, dialogue, and nobody has to agree with this. But, you know, again, um, yeah, uh, the, my hope is that more and more young people, all young people, but especially young people of color, will realize that excluding themselves from the Netherlands will only help the enemy. Yeah. And I think this is going to happen. This is happening. I mean, uh, like 10 years ago, when I was talking about this, everybody was saying I'm crazy, <laughs> right wing, right wing white, non-white, but now it's a different story. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. Um, I really believe in an open public debate uh, without judging each other. Like that's, again, I'm so grateful for you to org for organizing this, not only with me as a guest, but with everybody. I think pub debating each other, getting together is one of the main instruments against segregation. Uh, segregation of ideas is also very toxic. Yeah, yeah okay. no, exactly. No, and, I, and I think a big part of the reason maybe why a lot of people don't necessarily identify as Dutch is because there is, you know, segregation and, and discrimination yeah. in society. So people are, are separated. So, you know, starting yeah. with the first one, uh, how should we desegregate, you know, our schools, our neighborhoods and our society? Let's start with schools. Very simple. In the Netherlands, there's postcode vetum, postal code laws. It's by law. I mean, if you're if you're living in Rotterdam or in Amsterdam, where, wherever, and you're living in a so-called black neighborhood, that's the term, Zwartewijk. <laughs> I mean, think think of it. And you wanna, and you you have a kid, and you you, you wanna you know take your kid to a primary school, literally 300 meters to a different municipality or deelgemeente. Hoe zeg je dat? Like a district. To a different district. The Dutch law says no. The postcode law says you cannot just put your kid in another school in a different postal code, which is a very, um, which is the same as South Africa and the apartheid. The only difference is we don't explicitly mention skin color. So the simple answer is stop having laws, racist segregation laws. That would help help a lot. Yeah, but I mean, in some things you can probably desegregate, but. For instance, we have Article 23, which gives like, you know, separate education for different religions. And so if you look at maybe Islamic schools, there's no way realistically, politically that you could, you know, mix those. So uh, how do you get over such problems? Well, this Article 23 thing, I mean, that's, that's a topic we can, <laughs> we can have for a long time because this is really a hard, hard, deep thing in the Netherlands. For, I, you know, forget Article 23. I think when we talk about the housing markets, as it is called nowadays, when we talk about the postcode laws, when we talk about discrimination, um, you know, um, uh, institutional racism, there's a lot of ways besides Article 23 to desegregate the Netherlands. It's not hard. The only thing that that's lacking is political will, which uh, it, partly, at least, is uh, the effect of a lack of will by the people concerning this. We don't even have to tackle Article 23. We have still like 10 other things to tackle. And then maybe Article 23, which is the most difficult one. No. Yeah, I think there's basically two issues that are on the forefront on segregation is the issue we have to tackle as a society in more physical terms. Then we're, there's also discrimination on more social levels. Mm -hmm. What, what mm -hmm. measures do you support or do you fight for, do you suggest to fight a discrimination, for instance, on the yeah. labor market? Okay, and this is a very, oh man, I can really get, okay. Everybody has, has, has seen the two slackers come down. Poor people, especially people of color who have done nothing wrong, were really, really, um, really, you know, 
horribly treated by the Dutch government, horribly treated. Families were separated, people were debt ridden, they were labeled as, as, as frauds. I mean, a horrible scandal, it's been all over the news. If you're poor in the Netherlands and you make one little mistake, one little mistake, the government hunts you down, hunts you down until the last cent in your pocket. Okay, remember this. In, since 1986, there have been enormous uh, uh, scientific reports on labor market discrimination in the Netherlands. From 1986 until today, uh, uh, who's that? Uh, in, in, so uh, researchers were calling um, bureaus. Who? What's the English word? Yes, like agencies. Like yeah. So agencies. so yeah. Um, research, Dutch researchers have been calling um, agencies, and 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 they they said, you know, I I want to hire people, but I only want white people. I don't want people of color. And this, re this is like scientifically done with, 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 with uh, mystery guests and everything. Since 1986 until today, you know what? Between 70% and 75% of um, um, Dutch companies, organizations discriminate. We know this. We know who they are. We have their names. We have, you know. But never ever has Dutch politics said we're going to chase these racist employers down and find them and put them in jail or nothing, nothing. You see, you see, you see what I'm talking about. No. You, you see, you see the class justice in this country. So again, a simple answer to your question: the way to tackle racism is to tackle racism. But there's no political will. No, no. I think one of the policies you mentioned that's maybe more controversial is the idea of quotas, and I think many people are against it because. Kind of, if you would discriminate in favor of one group, by definition, you discriminate against another group, and in particular, that other group is in the majority. So, how can you? How would you justify such a policy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy you use the term quota, but because that's the way it's termed in the Netherlands: quota or positive discrimination, discrimination, which in fact was also the way it was implemented when it was implemented. I mean, I'm not even exaggerating. Like, whether it's gender or ethnicity, there have been throughout the years many instances of quota. So, okay, we're, we the government has subsidies for an X percent women in a certain organization. So this organization, you know, hires women, one or two, to, you know, to get the subsidy. These women are put in women positions in this organization. And when the subsidy stops, they're fired again. Same, same goes for ethnicity. This is the way the Netherlands did quota. It still does. This is not what I want. This is, this is even worse. I'm really for what's called affirmative action. You are affirming society. So when, you're, when you have quota, not as a uh, policy tool for subsidies and when the subsidy stops, it's done, but as a, as a real conscious conscious efforts for affirming society, then there's another way to do quota. Quota as a, as a, as a means to an end. Yeah. Quota as a means to get organizations used to diversity. And the end will be that even without subsidies, these organizations will understand the importance of diversity. So it would basically be a, a time-bound measure um, to reach a certain level of diversity. And once that is set, you hope that there's a enough big pull factor to get other people to apply and um, have diverse people also choose who's who gets a job. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, to make to make it more concrete, um, so when you as a government say, okay, now we ha we have a diversity subsidy for two years, right? This is the way the Netherlands does it, or five years, whatever. So if you have 10% people of color and 20% women, you get this subsidy for five years. I'm just making up numbers, okay. This is the wrong way because after those five years, the subsidy stops and the organization says, bye-bye. A right way to do, in my opinion, would be if the government would say, if your organization doesn't have 40% or 50% women and 30% people of color, you're gonna be fined every year, really hard. No. That's a, that's a better way to do it, 
And trust me, after one generation, organizations will, won't even need this sanction to be diverse because they get used to it. Yeah. Now, of course, there's many people who say, you know, let's say someone like me gets a job at one of these companies. And then, you know, all the people there think, oh, I only got the job because of affirmative action. And uh, that it creates maybe like a negative perception or also maybe more racial mm. tension because people say, oh, all these people mm. of color, they're only getting in there <laughs> these quotas. Yeah. Uh, it's discrimination yeah. against white people, reverse racism. How do, how, how do you respond to that? I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. This is the standard mechanism. I mean, and what, there's what, okay. This answer you will get anyways, <laughs> even, <laughs> even if you have a job without the subsidy, without quota. This is what this is the response you're going to get in the Netherlands. So you might as well just do it. I mean, even if you, <laughs> I've I've never had a di uh, diversity quota job in my life, but I still get this reaction. So you know, it doesn't matter. And I think what's interesting is that uh, studies have shown that a more diverse workforce actually leads to an increased efficiency, yep. uh, more problem-based solutions, and still there's this idea that you need a subsidy to actually have something that's enhancing you even more. I mean, you just well put, you know, I don't have anything to add to this. I mean, even if you would look at it morally, you would, you might, you might even say, even if it doesn't increase your profit, you should do it. But yeah, I mean, in any case, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Now minorities are underrepresented and we've talked about this now because of discrimination, but um, probably also because there's real differences in, schooling, in income, in education, um, and quotas can't fix all of that, especially if we perceive no. it as same qualifications and then a diverse person would get a job. No. Um, so shouldn't the main focus be to treat the cause and not just the symptom? No. Well, I'm not really sure because, I mean, um, I, I, I've been talking to a lot of people of color who, in the Netherlands who are electro technicians. Which, is, which, is, which doesn't require a uh, university level education, but which, which does require very um, skillful, uh, you know, skillful uh, uh, attitude. Even in electrotechnics, there's racial discrimination. Same thing with gender. I mean, the, the, there's a myth that, um, um, I mean, let's, let me put it another way. You have to trust me on this one. When men get together, especially white men, with all due respect, there's a certain mechanism of ons kent ons, of old, old boys network, whatever, how, whatever you want to call it, which creates automatic um, blindness to other uh, relevant factors like profits or an increased uh, um, marketability or other things you mentioned. I mean, you don't have, we shouldn't underestimate the hu human part of this, you know, uh, in this way, I think it's it's important to at least um, to at least have, have have a bulwark, first bulwark with real quota to create diversity necessarily, and then after one or two generations, it will come automatically. Now, Simi, it's been five years since you published your book. Do you see any positive changes since then? Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean. Um, yeah, the, the way young people nowadays are talking about diversity, inclusion, citizenship, and whether they agree with me or not. I mean, I'm really impressed and inspired by the way young people nowadays are engaged with these topics. And in my opinion, more and more and more should, should, should be aware and should be engaged. But trust me, when I was your age, you were really off the wall when you wanted to talk about this. So, I mean... There's hope in you, definitely. That's good to hear. So the road we're heading at, at least we're going in the right direction. A absolutely, absolutely. That's good to hear. Yeah. Now, do we have more? Yeah, we actually did have one last maybe clarifying uh, question from the audience. Because of course, earlier in the interview, you, you talked about tolerance and how it, it kind of is automatically unequal. Like, you know, I tolerate you, but uh, I don't mm -hmm. like you. And I guess sort of the question is, why is it in why is it inherently or necessarily unequal tolerance? Uh, well, I I can quote Saint Augustine to explain this. He I think he Saint Augustine, fourth century church father from North Africa, by the way, from Algeria. You know, he said, 
I'm going to quote in Latin. He said, tolerantia non est nisi in malis, which means tolerance doesn't exist without the evil. The evil is div uh, you know, divine opinions, minorities, anything that's not uh, considered to be part of society is divine. St. Augustine said, when you stop persecuting, when you stop killing those deviant groups, you become tolerant. I think it's a very good definition. I think it's better than being killed, don't get me wrong. But in modern in the 21st century, I don't want to be tolerated in my own country. I want to be accepted as an equal. All right. I think we covered a lot of ground today. <laughs> very, uh, very thankful for, for the talk with you. Thanks You're for welcome. joining us. Um, yeah, I think that's it from for now. Thank you to our viewers as well. Um, and if you want to uh, keep updated with our coming interviews, you can check our Instagram, you can check us out on Facebook. And, and YouTube. Um, and YouTube, exactly. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. And of course, you can uh, check out uh, your book as well. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye bye.